Olá, bem-vindos de volta. A última apresentação, antes do intervalo, teve a ver com condições especiais de voo, transporte de doentes críticos por via aérea. E a apresentação que segue tem a ver precisamente também com o transporte de um tipo particular de pacientes, doentes no pós-cirúrgico oftalmológico, e vai-nos falar sobre a dinâmica do ar no globo ocular em voo. Vamos ter connosco o Dr. Stephen Houston, que é médico aeronáutico e médico do trabalho sénior dos serviços de saúde da British Airways. Hello, Stephen. Welcome. Hi, I And hope you can hear me. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon. The floor is yours. Okay, well, I'd like to share my screen. Hopefully you can see it. All I can see is myself. We can see your screen, yes. It's not the screen I want you to see. Okay, we can see your desktop now. You're clicking on your presentation. Do you, is there, is there any way I could help you from, from here right now? Okay, there's something coming up. So that's your desktop again. We can see you clicking on your file. And if, do, Do we have your presentation on our side, maybe? Uh, no. Okay. I think I need some technical ha help. Okay, some technical help for Dr. Houston. Um, I need to talk to uh, someone here. <laughs> Little glitch. I'm sure it'll be all right very soon. There you are. It's on, Stephen. It's on. Okay. <laughs> do you know? The most nervous moment for me is always things to do with IT. So now I can relax. So thank you, uh, Rui, and thank you, Portugal Air Summit, for inviting uh, me, as uh, from British Airways today, to speak about what actually happens inside the eye to the air bubbles um, after eye surgery. It's quite an indulgence to be able to speak for 15 minutes on this topic, well, probably a little bit less now. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what, what we uh, did was we looked at the 10 largest airlines on the planet and we asked for opinion about when it might be safe to fly after intraocular gas injection. And we got a range of answers from six days through to six weeks. And what about those people who are traveling over mountainous terrain uh, by road? Such as this one in Romania, the Transfer Garishan, which I've been lucky enough to be able to travel along myself. Uh, modern vitreoretinal surgical techniques frequently employ the injection of long acting gas into the vitreous cavity to support the retina against the underlying Retinal, pigmented, uh, retinal pigment epithelial layer, which is the sticky, the sticky layer of the eye uh, to seal any retinal breaks. Now I'm hoping the next slide plays for you because it, it actually shows you what happens during eye surgery. And I'm sure some people will find it interesting. It lasts for 90 seconds and there's some audio as well. 
I'm gonna play. Hopefully you find that interesting. Uh, what it's actually showing is the surgeon replacing the vitreous jelly with gas. It's called a uh, vitreous gas exchange. Now, obviously, gas inside the eye, we would be interested in Boyle's law, which is the uh, law which states that the absolute pressure and gas volume are inversely related in a closed isothermal system such as the eye. And we know that the typical cabin altitude for a commercial airliner is 6,000 feet or thereabouts. And that uh, pressure reduction will cause a 25% increase in gas volume. We also know that performance A aircraft, which are the typical aircraft used by airlines, take about 20 minutes from takeoff to reach the cruising flight level. So we now have a time, a time frame. So we've got a 25% gas expansion in a 20 minute period. The tendency for a gas bubble to expand is countered by the limited elasticity of the corneoscleral shell of the eye. And this causes a rise in intraocular pressure. Now, we're talking about this subject today because it can cause a rise in intraocular pressure can cause a sudden and profound irreversible sight loss, which can, continues to happen uh, throughout the world. Uh, somebody somewhere will fly on an aircraft and end up irreversibly blind. So it's an important topic. The intraocular pressure change is a dynamic phenomenon. It's influenced not just by the pressure changes causing bubble expansion, but it's also influenced by a self-regulating compensatory mechanism within the eye, which in a nutshell is actually a change in the aqueous humor outflow facility. The aqueous humor outflow facility has been estimated in humans to be 0.25 microliters per minute per millimeter of mercury. So if we know that it, uh, we've got 20 minutes, we know that the maximum outflow facility of the eye over a 20 minute period, i.e. during the climb to the cruising flight level, is of only 90 microliters of fluid. So if we have a bubble inside the eye, and we know that 25% is equal to 90 microliters in order to keep the pressure constant, the intraocular pressure constant, we can then calculate by mathematical modeling that the maximum bubble size is only 360 microliters. This is the maximum theoretical bubble size that the eye can accommodate without there being an increase in intraocular pressure. And in fact, in the early 90s, I think it was a Canadian ophthalmologist called Mills actually put patients into a hyperbaric chamber to see just how much gas the patient could tolerate before they complained of a painful eye. And he noticed that patients generally could tolerate 0.6 to 
to one mil, which is 600 to 1,000 microliters before the eye became painful. So in other words, the, mathematic, the mathematical model roughly matches the world, the real world experience in hyperbaric chamber. You probably couldn't repeat that study nowadays because of uh, ethical considerations. The resorption time for various gases is shown. I would like to highlight sulfur hexafluoride and perfluorocarbon gases. Perfluorocarbon gases are now the most commonly used gases uh, during eye surgery. Uh, where there is a fluid gas exchange. And you can see 10 to 65 days is the time it takes for that gas to resorb. The purpose of this slide is simply to show that the, the, the human eye volume uh, for the vitreous is typically four mils or 4,000 microliters. And for the anterior chamber of the eye, it's 300 microliters. So if we take a typical surgery, the surgeon is doing a fluid gas exchange. He's replacing the vitreous with the gas. That's 4,000 microliters of vitreous being replaced by C3F8, which is the perfluorocarbon gas. We know that the half-life of that gas is six days. And we know that gas absorption from the eye follows first order kinetics, which is that the volume of the gas reduces by half every half-life. So after three half-lives, we'll have gone from 4,000 microliters, the entire vitreous volume, down to 500 microliters. And if your patient is an artist, they might even draw you some nice pictures of what they are seeing as a patient as they look through their bubble. Now, remember, bubbles are buoyant, so they float up and they rest against the superior retina. But of course, in the visual field, the patient sees the bubble in the inferior visual field. And a patient here in diagram A, you can see A compared to C, the bubble is shrinking with time as it is absorbed. Now, there's a certain amount of inter-individual variability how a gas is uh, resorbed. So um, you've got to allow for that. It's therefore standard practice to advise patients not to fly or indeed travel by car over mountainous terrain until two weeks have passed after a sulfur hexafluoride gas inject injection, or six weeks after uh, C3F8, which is a perfluoroethane injection, or perfluoropropane injection, which is actually the most common gas used uh, for retinal surgery. And the decision should always involve the treating physician, first of all, to confirm the gas that was used. And secondly, they knew their patient, they know the inter-individual variations that might apply for this patient. This is the IATA medical manual guidance, which is really quite clear. Now, of course, if you have your uh, vitreoretinal surgery in a center of excellence in Denver, which is already at a cabin altitude, more or less, the advice might change slightly. You can read this for yourself in a published paper in the Aviation Space and Environmental Medicine uh, Journal, Commercial Air Travel After Intraocular Gas Injection, or indeed travel to high mountainous elevations following vitrectomy with intraocular gas. And I hope that you find this indulgence uh, interesting. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we will be taking questions online in the next three days. So if you have any questions from our audience, I'll be forwarding them to you. And uh, um, I hope you will have uh, some more available time for us uh, to uh, answer those questions that we can then feed back to, to our members. Um, so thank you again. And